Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to EdTech Live. Today is Saturday, October 6th, and my guest today is Richard Stallman. Welcome, Richard. Hi. Thanks for talking with me. Thanks for participating. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, talk a little bit about the free software movement, and give us a sense of the um, the importance of free software for schools? First of all, I should explain what free software is all about. Free software means software that respects the user's freedom. Now, this is in contrast to proprietary software, which most of the people listening have probably dealt with, software that keeps the users divided and helpless, forbidden to share with anyone, and unable to change the software. So proprietary software puts the developer of the program in a position of power over the users. That is unjust, and the aim of free software is to put an end to that power, to give the users their freedom. There are four essential freedoms that every user of software is entitled to. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and then change it so that the program does what you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That's the freedom to make copies and distribute them to others, including publication, when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to help build your community. That's the freedom to distribute, including publish, your modified versions when you wish. So if you are free to do all these things when you wish, then the program is free software. And you should always be free to do these things. Software should always be free. And that's the aim of the free software movement, to establish and then defend these freedoms for all users. We haven't achieved this yet. So most people in schools are probably using proprietary software. Yes, and that's a really sad thing because <clears throat> it's against the mission of the school to teach the use of proprietary software. There are four reasons why schools should always teach free software exclusively. I'll start with the most superficial one, which is to save money. Because people are free to redistribute copies of free software and then free to run them, the school system or anybody can distribute copies to all the schools and nobody is required to pay anybody anything. You don't have to pay for permission to use the free software because you're free to run it. And so schools can save money this way. Now, even in the richest countries, the schools don't have enough money. They're limited in what they can do by their budgets. They shouldn't be spending any of this limited budget getting permission to run software. However, this is rather superficial, and some proprietary software developers eliminate this reason by handing out gratis copies of their non-free software to schools. And that brings us to the second reason once we ask why they do this. The reason they do this is not because they are altruistic and want to promote education. It's because they are trying to use the schools as lovers to impose dependency on their software on the whole society. Because <clears throat> teaching someone to use a proprietary program is like addicting that person to a drug. It is, it's creating a dependency that's likely to last for a lifetime. And that dependency is exactly what those companies want. It's like any drug pusher, they might give you the first dose gratis, but not uh, after that. Once these students have learned to use proprietary software and then graduate, they will not be offered gratis copies, and neither will the companies they work for. And that is where the dependency that these schools create for those companies pays off for the companies. This is not what schools are for. Schools are not supposed to be teaching their students dependency on these companies. They should be teaching their students capability and independence 
They should be teaching these students to be citizens of a free society. So schools have a, re a social responsibility to direct their the society that they are, that they serve into the path of freedom and capability. And that means teaching the students to use free software. But there is a deeper reason. The third reason is for the sake of education in programming. Some people are fascinated by computers and programming. And at the age of around 13, more or less, they will want to learn everything about how the computer system works. So if those students are using a, a program, they're likely to want to know how that program does what it does. But when the student asks the teacher, how does this program work, if the program is proprietary, the teacher will have to say, I'm sorry, I don't know, and you're not allowed to know because it's a secret. And thus, education cannot begin. But with free software, if the program that the student is asking about is free software, the teacher can say, well, I'll tell you this much, which is what I know. And if you want to learn more, here's the source code of the program, which, of course, the teacher had ready in case the student asks this question. So read this, and you'll understand it all. And if there's anything that you have trouble figuring out, show it to me, and I'll explain. I'll look at it with you, and we'll both try to figure it out together. <clears throat> now, this is how those students, who are the students with a natural gift for programming, can turn that gift into the skill of writing good code. For them, it's not necessary to be taught to program, because that's obvious. But writing good code clear code that other people can understand is something else. The way you learn to write good code is by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. Free software gives them that opportunity. Proprietary software forbids that opportunity. So schools that want to pr provide the opportunity for these gifted pupils to become great programmers must do so by using free software. But there's a deeper reason. The last reason applies to all students, and it's for the sake of moral education. You see, schools are not just supposed to teach facts and skills. They need to teach the spirit of goodwill, of helping your neighbor. So every class should have a rule Children, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share it with the rest of the class. And this way, students learn the habit of cooperating with their neighbors and the habit of sharing knowledge, which after all is what school is all about. But the school has to follow its own rule in order to set a good example, which means that the school also should only bring free software to class and should tell the students, you can copy this, you can take it home, because this is free. So I think it's interesting that your first point, the one that you, the, that you said is saving money, you called superficial. Yes. Because I think what you're saying is, although that may seem compelling, <clears throat> Uh, free, and we should define the word free here. Well, free software means it respects your freedom. It's a matter of freedom, not price. So right. if you should think of free as in free speech, not free as in free beer. It's too bad that English doesn't have a clear word for this. In Spanish, if I say software libre, people know I'm not saying software gratuito. Uh, they have a word that means only free as in freedom and doesn't mean zero price. We in English don't have one. Sometimes people say Libra software, borrowing this Spanish or French word, as a way of making the distinction clear. Free software doesn't always have to be gratis. 
because freedom number two, the freedom to distribute copies, includes the freedom to give away copies, but also the freedom to sell copies. If you want to sell a copy and someone else wants to buy it, that, that's, that's something you're both free to do with free software. It's very important to un this is this is important for understanding what we're all about because this is not a campaign to get rid of buying and selling. It's not a campaign against commerce. It's a campaign for freedom. Now, the re the first reason the reason of saving money is superficial because saving money doesn't change what a school can do. It just enables the school to do more. If you had enough money to do any three of of the things on a certain list and you get some more, well, maybe you could do four or five of them. But it, there's no fundamental change in the nature of what the school does. Whereas the deeper reasons change the nature of the, of the results of going to that school. Well, I think that's really important. That's an important distinction to make because... I think what I, part of what I'm hearing you say is that if we if we if we use freedom in the sense of gratis, then we we potentially put ourselves in a position where if somebody gives you software, you're missing the other benefits. Exactly. That a proprietary company might give software away, but that in fact you're missing the benefits of free software. Of freedom, yes, because they will let you out of paying them if they think that having you as a user will increase their leverage over the rest of society, but they won't let go of the levers. So, Richard, when you talked about the four essential freedoms, can you tell our listeners why you started with zero? Oh, well, that's bec it's partly because we programmers like to count starting from zero, but the specific occasion for this was I used to talk about freedoms one, two, and three, and they're the same as freedoms one, two, and three now. And then I, because I thought that freedom zero could be taken for granted. And then I discovered that, that, that is, if you, I believed, and it's true in some legal systems, that if you have freedoms one, two, and three, then freedom zero is automatic with it. And then I found out that that wasn't true everywhere. So I concluded I better mention freedom zero as one of the essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. And in, in, so in many, in many legal systems, if you have a copy of the source code and you are free to, dis to copy and distribute it and so on, then automatically you'll be free to run it. But this is not true everywhere, and that's why I, uh, I decided that the freedom to run the software has to be mentioned explicitly. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how the free software movement started and in your own personal background? My background is what led me to start the free software movement. See, in the 1970s, while I worked at the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT, I was part of a community of programmers who shared software. In fact, at the Artificial Intelligence Lab, we used a time-sharing operating system that had been developed by this community, and it was all free software. And my job was to continue the development of the system and make it better in whatever way I could think of. So I got to experience the free software way of life in a very developed form by becoming part of this community. So after this community died in the early 1980s, I was then confronted by the prospect of spending the rest of my life with users subjugating proprietary software. And the contrast was stark. Of course, by that time, there were probably a few million computer users in the world, and all of them were using proprietary software because our enclave of freedom was had disappeared and so had other areas of freedom which had existed earlier. <clears throat> so I wasn't unique in experiencing proprietary software, but I was one of the few who had seen 
another way of life and experienced it and lived it. So when I saw this contrast, I said, I refuse to live that way. I refuse to accept a life of proprietary software, of subjugating and being subjugated. I want a life of freedom, and I want it for others as well as for myself. So I started the free software movement. How important was it, do you think, that you were in an academic environment? Well, I don't know. Directly, I would say it probably wasn't important, but it's probably no coincidence that this community existed in an academic environment, in, in, a, in an academic research lab, where we were not under pressure to make the users of our software pay us. And where the spirit, also the spirit of scientific cooperation, which back in the 70s was still valued in academia, was part of the inspiration that affected our work in the lab and which motivated me to start the free software movement as well. It's interesting that you say the spirit of scientific cooperation that existed in the 70s. My brother's a professor um, at a university, and I was telling him the parallels between uh, free software and the, the academic world or the openness of scientific knowledge, and he kind of laughed a little. Um, do you think things have changed? Well, it's partly, they have changed, definitely. Uh, and partly, of course, you know, there were always professors sitting on their data and so on, which was very harmful to science, but they did it. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to say that that scientific cooperation in the 1970s and before was perfect, but people did learn a few hundred years ago uh, that it wasn't good for scientists to sit on their knowledge. There was a time when ma when mathematicians kept their mathematical discoveries secret in order to one-up each other. And then people realized that this didn't lead to progress. So this, the idea of publishing and contributing to human knowledge was understood then to be what we had to do to, to make science progress. This was to a large extent destroyed by the U.S. government with a law that was adopted in the early 80s. I think it's called the Bayh-Dole Law, which enabled universities getting federal funds to get and keep patents on what they developed with those federal funds. And since then, university administrators have been pressuring the professors, both pressuring and seducing the professors and students into doing this. And as a result, a commercialization spirit has distorted the spirit of scientific cooperation. Now, it's interesting that you brought up patents because that certainly raises some real issues for things that are going on today. Well, yes, there are several areas where patents create particular problems for humanity. <clears throat> totally different problems, by the way. Well, one of these areas is in patents on medicine, and that creates a very simple kind of problem that the patent holders make the medicine too expensive for poor people, and this is mass murder. I've recommended to people that everybody, somebody dies, every time someone dies in a poor country because he couldn't afford some patented medicine that's horribly expensive, that they should put up uh, as a monument patented to death by the World Trade Organization. That this should stir up the kind of opposition which will eventually destroy the World Trade Op Organization. That's an oppressive organization that is the enemy of democracy and serves the rich by killing the poor. 
So that's a tremendously important problem because it's a matter of life and death. But it's very simple. It's just a matter of the price. After all, you can't copy these medicines. That's not how anybody can make them. There's no, there's no, no technology to copy them. If you had one pill, there was no way you could. There's no way anybody could take that one pill and just turn out a bunch of other pills just like it. In Forbidden Planet, Robbie the Robot could do that, but that's science fiction. It's not real technology. So there's no issue about whether you're free to copy medicines because it's a moot point since you can't. It's just a matter of whether somebody can go into business making the medicine for and selling it for a price that's enough for them to make some money over the course of making it. India used to have a very wise patent law which did not allow patenting a drug, but did allow patenting a process for making a drug. They designed this in order to encourage research on making known drugs more cheaply. They figured that India couldn't contribute much to the world's cumulative research on finding new drugs, but that it could contribute a lot to the research on making known drugs cheap enough for lots of people in India and elsewhere to be able to get them. And this was quite effective, but the World Trade Organization forced them to change it. So that's one problem area with patents. Another area is patents on things that farmers grow. Forbidding farmers to save their seeds. Forbidding farmers perhaps from breeding and then exchanging their animals. Now, this... It, this, these agricultural plants and animals are one of the few kinds of material things that we can copy. Uh, not perfectly, of course, because when they reproduce, they recombine genes. They're not clones, but in a sense, they're copying each other. They're, they're copying themselves, and, uh, and farmers use this practice forbidding farmers to do this is another outrage of the World Trade Organization. <clears throat> but it's a completely different issue because it's not just an issue of price. It's an issue of freedom. Freedom for farmers to continue doing what they've always done. And the third area where patents create a, a big problem is when applied to the software area. But again, it's a totally different kind of problem. Because here, the problem is that programmers are not allowed to program. Patent law is totally different from copyright law. They have very few details in common. And so, to think clearly about them, you have to start by treating them as two separate areas to understand separately. When copyright law is applied to software, it means that if you write a program, you have the copyright on it. Well, that's not necessarily a good thing. You could use that copyright to make the program proprietary and deny users the freedoms that they should have. But you don't have to worry that you will be sued by a stranger with whom you have no relationship on the grounds that you're not allowed to write code like the code you wrote. Copyright doesn't do that. If you wrote the code, only you would have the copyright, not some stranger. But with patents, that stranger could have a patent on some algorithm that you implemented, some technique that you implemented, some feature that you implemented. And then, once he sees what your program does, he could sue you and say, you're not allowed to program that way. Now, what does this do? You have to understand that programs are very complicated. Sure, you can write a simple program, but it's common for programs to be very large. Millions of lines of code is not unusual. So how many techniques and algorithms and features are implemented in a million lines? Probably many thousands. So if each one of them could be patented. Writing that program is like crossing a minefield. When you cross a minefield, each step you take is pretty safe. 
the chance that each step will step on a mine is small. But you have to keep walking and walking. So the danger adds up. Each time you put in a certain technique or feature or algorithm, each time you make a design decision, chances are nothing's going, nothing bad is going to happen to you. But there's so many of these design decisions you have to make, and each one of them is yet another risk of stepping on a patent. So the result is that large programs all infringe lots of patents, and the developers are just hoping they won't get sued. Certainly this has been in the news a lot lately, uh, especially in, in the academic community with regard to to programs that have been alternatives to proprietary software that are now in a position of getting sued. Yes, uh, I don't know of a lot of them, but potentially there are a lot of there are a lot of potential such cases. Uh, yes, sometimes patent holders have suppressed free software. For instance, a few years ago, there was a free MP3 encoder, which was suppressed by a, a marauding patent holder. And the patent was originally obtained by a laboratory, uh, which I think is a semi-academic laboratory, although I'm not sure. It's not. It's not a. It's not just a, a business's lab. Uh, and then it was sold to a company that simply uses it as a weapon to gain whatever they can gain. And that patent shouldn't exist. No software patent should exist. To ha to allow software techniques or features or algorithms to be patented is only to create obstacles to software development. It makes no sense. It's a system designed to encourage more building block ideas to be available by putting those who combine these ideas in danger. Now, if the limiting factor on our field were the basic ideas, then maybe such a system would, would do more good than harm. But the limiting factor in programming is writing large programs that combine thousands of these building block ideas. And any system that... Uh, that encourages a side area by by endangering the main activity is self-defeating. Even if you ignore the effect on people's freedom, it's simply self-defeating. Richard, can we shift gears for, for a minute? Sure. So tell me a little bit about what's happened recently in India. And the, um, the the one is it a state or a province there? That's I think it, I think they call it a state. Its name is Kerala, and it's in the uh, southeast, sorry, southwest tip of India. The, the southern, southern, the western side of the southern tip of India is where Kerala is, and they've made the final decision to migrate all their state-run schools to free software. They've already migrated the ninth grade, and the idea is that each year the next grade is going to migrate. So how many schools does that involve? I don't know, but the population is millions. I think I read somewhere that it was 14,000 schools. Is that possible? It's. I don't know, but we could say if, if each school has 1,000 people, then that would be... 14 million people, that seems too much. 14, 14 million students would be too much. Um, so I don't know. And uh, and so they're, they're converting to free software. Yes, they're using the GNU plus Linux operating system. Now, uh, this might be a good opportunity for you to explain uh, the difference between the terms free software and open source software. Well, I've explained that free software is a social movement to 
to give computer users freedom and control over their own computing. <clears throat> In the 1990s, as many free software packages became popular, and as the GNU plus Linux operating system became popular, a lot of the people who used it, especially at the beginning, were techies who were fascinated by technology. So many of them didn't pay much attention to the question of freedom and just and, they, and were more interested in, in how much fun it was to work with this system. And then they discovered that it was very reliable once they'd worked on it together for a while. And it was also very powerful, especially compared with something like Windows. And it was also obviously cheap to operate because you didn't have to pay for permission. And thus, it started to spread. And these people, while we free software activists were talking about freedom and community as the ethical goals of free software, they were talking about technical advantages. And they interested many other techies who only ever heard about technical advantages, and they repeated these to others. So by the mid-90s, there were two camps, you might say, within our community. Those of us who considered, who, had, who were working for ethical goals, and those who were working for technical, practical goals. And in 1998, the latter group started using the term open source as a way that they could talk about what we had all been doing without ever calling to mind those of us who were championing freedom. And you've also used the phrase GNU plus Linux. Yes. We're talking about we're talking about the GNU operating system together with Linux the kernel. When I started the free software movement in nineteen eighty three I was looking for how I could make it possible to use a computer and have freedom. That was impossible at the time. And the reason was that the computer is useless without an operating system. And at the time, all the operating systems for modern computers were proprietary. So I thought, what can I do to change this? And I realized that the thing that I could most likely do to change this was to write another operating system, since operating system development was my field. And then I could make it free, and thus everyone would be able to use computers and have freedom. Well, I didn't have to write it all myself. If I could convince other people to join me and help write the system, we could get it done faster and make it better, and together we would make it free. So that's what the free software movement did. We started the project to develop the GNU operating system, whose aim was to be a free operating system. So that we began in 1984. By 1990, we had almost all the necessary components for the system, but one important component was missing, that being the kernel. We began developing a kernel in 1990, but our project, for a combination of reasons, didn't work out well, and it still isn't really usable. Some volunteers continue working on it, but fortunately, we didn't have to wait for that kernel because Linus Torvalds developed the kernel, which is Linux. So, in 1992, he made it free software, and at that point, the combination of GNU and Linux was a complete free operating system. So I just looked up while we were while you were talking. Uh, one one article says that it's 2,500 schools in Kerala. Um, another from India says that it's 12,500 schools, but it's not clear that they're, they're all converting. They may just be being encouraged to use. Well, I don't. Work. Well, I know that that they are converting all of the schools, but it's one grade at a time. And of course, this only applies to. Uh, it's, it's grade starting at grade nine because I don't think the uh, lower grades have computers yet. But I'm confident at this point that 
when those lower grades start to get computers that they will also run free software. So if we were talking about uh, sort of two basic ways in which free software is used in schools, one being just its use, and the second being its use as an educational tool in learning programming, mm -hmm. will both be applicable in India? I don't know. I haven't asked them. Because from my point of view, the most important thing in terms of its practical effect is just that the students are using a free operating system so that when they graduate, they know how to use a free operating system. But by the same token, for the same reasons, though, all the other software that the school uses in class should also be free. Richard, one of the phrases that's often used to describe you is an, that you're a hacker. Yeah. Now, now, for a lot of people, that word may not mean the same thing that it means to well, you. Well, it was distorted by journalists around 1980. But what the word hacker meant in the community at MIT, which I participated in, was, a, was basically enjoying using your intelligence cleverly with gusto in a playful spirit. Now, this could mean programming. It could also apply in other areas of life, which have nothing to do with computers. For instance, at MIT, there's a, a custom of hacking, which involves, uh, which is a sort of of practical joke whose flavor is hard to describe. It's not typically on anybody, at least not in recent decades. But, you know, for instance, putting, putting a house on top of the Great Dome or putting a telephone on top of the Great Dome with a working connection to the MIT phone exchange or putting a mock campus police car with mock policemen on top of the dome or putting a nipple on top of the dome. Well, these were all hacks that were actually done. And they're funny. So, when you participate in a community that does hacking, you come to appreciate hack value, which is the kind of funniness that a hack has. It's, it's, it's not just funny, but it also there's something clever to admire as cleverness. And often it works by flipping a rule over somehow. So the technique of copyleft is a hack, and the name goes with it. So talk a little bit about what copyleft is. When I started developing free software for the GNU project, I was aware that if I simply put it in the public domain, others would be able to make modifications and release their modified versions as proprietary software. And of course, people would find that an attractive thing to do. And the result would be that the users wouldn't get freedom. They'd be getting my code, and they'd be getting the features that I had implemented, plus whatever was added, but they would not have it in freedom. And that would completely defeat my aim, which was specifically to give them freedom. So I had to develop a way to stop that. The way I developed is copyleft. Copyleft is based legally on copyright law. Here's how it works. First of all, I claim copyright on the work, which nowadays is essentially automatic, but wasn't really then. And so I'll put on a copyright notice, and then I start telling people what they're permitted to do, which are the four freedoms. They're free to run this as they wish. They're free to, uh, to change it. They're free to distribute copies. They're free to publish their modified versions. But there is a condition. And the condition says that every version, every copy of every version you distribute must in its entirety be covered by these same terms. Which means 
that when you pass on your version to somebody else, you have to give him the same freedom that I gave you. And this way, everyone who gets the software gets the freedom as well. So we ensure the freedom of every user by forbidding the middlemen to take it away, to strip it off before it gets to you. In other words, forbidding is forbidden. How many different licenses are there that fall under the free software movement? Well, there are many free software licenses. In today's world, anything written is automatically copyrighted. So the only way a program can be free software is if it has a statement of permissions on it. And we call that a free software license. Uh, so any such statement of permissions that gives the user the four freedoms is a free software license. And there are at least dozens that are in use. Are there situations in which people are opening the source code but are not? Uh, well, let's, well, that's somewhat of a confusion. You might think opening the source code means letting people see the source code. But if, if so, then you are misunderstanding. But, but that term obviously is meant to refer to open source. Now, I don't support open source. I don't advocate that view, and I'd rather not use that term. But, but if you do want to use it, you should not distort what they mean by it. Simply to make the source visible doesn't qualify for open source. The criteria for open source are derived from our criteria for free software, and they require more or less the f same four freedoms, although they've stated it in a very different way. But yes, there are cases, of, there are licenses which are open source, which do qualify for, under their criteria, and that we have rejected as too restrictive. But they are not used very much. I also hear a lot about open standards, and I think the school markets hear that as well. And I, and I think it's important to clarify the difference between free software and open standards. Well, first of all, what's the difference between a program and a standard? It's like the difference between you and the English language. The English language is a specification for communications. You are one implementation of that spec two totally different kinds of things. Well, a standard is a specification for communication. And a program might implement that standard or it might implement something close to that standard. So once you have the relationship between these two categories in, clearly in mind, then it's easy to understand the relationship between what we say about the two categories. An open standard is a standard that is published. There's a standard. There, there, there's something written down which describes it. Now, there are also communications languages that are secret. For instance, uh, some programs talk on the network using a secret protocol with a network site. Well, that's not a, using an open standard. That's using a secret, a secret language for communication. And some, uh, you know, <clears throat> word files are an example of a secret of a secret specification. Microsoft has never published the full specs of the current version of Word format. So the only way we can make our free software interoperate with Microsoft Word is by ex trial and error experimentation. So one of the things that using open standards means is don't use word format for communication with anybody. When people send me word files, I don't even try to read them. Even though 
I have free software that could probably read most of them. I won't use it because I want to point out to people that the practice of using whatever secret format Microsoft gives you is, oh, is something we have to resist. So every time someone sends me such a file, I use that as an opportunity for education. So uh, one place that I went to find out information about you, Richard, was Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, how have you felt about these emerging uh, web technologies? That well, Wikipedia seems pretty good. And I'm happy to say it's also free. Free in the sense of freedom, the same as free software. Now tell us why you say that. Uh, because it respects the same four freedoms. It's the same definition. It's released under a free license. So you are free to copy Wikipedia and set it up somewhere else and then make your own changes. And then pass it on to others. So just so that we're clarifying for people, m most people are going to use Wikipedia to research, some small number might actually contribute. What you're talking about is the fact that the actual underlying software that... No, 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 not the software. I'm not talking about the software. I'm talking about the text, the actual encyclopedia entries. They are free. Now, the software they're using is also free. But that's not what I'm referring to now. And you can, refer, you can view their website using a free browser. That's good, too. Otherwise, I couldn't even consider doing it. But that's not the same, same question. We're talking about the text that they have produced to explain thousands of subjects. So that's really helpful for me to understand. So you're saying basically because the content is free, I'd rather not call it content. It's an encyclopedia, and it has entries in it. The term content is one that I reject as a term for works of authorship because it devalues them. Now, we constantly hear people from media companies talking about the great value of their content, but the value they mean is a different kind. They just mean how much money they can get from people for, for looking at it. And they really don't value the actual works in an intellectual sense. For them, those works are just content. They have a box which is going to collect money from people, and they need to put something inside the box to attract people to pay. And for their, from their point of view, it doesn't matter what those works are. I value works in a different way, in a way that has to do with what they say, what's good about them, and I don't want to call them content. But yes, we're talking about the actual encyclopedia, a large collection of text divided into many entries, and that text is free. So help me to understand, Richard, is the text in Wikipedia, is it um, under Creative Commons license? What, what license? Uh, well, there's no such thing as Creative Commons license, but that's a different subject. Uh, that's a misnomer, a misunderstanding. Uh, it's released under the GNU Free Documentation License. So they're actually using a, the license that you helped develop or develop? I wrote, yes. Which is the I, I wrote it for use on our manuals because an operating system needs to have manuals in it, not just programs. And they adopted it. Now, Creative Commons is an organization that makes licenses. Some of those licenses are free. Some of them are not free, but they're acceptable, in my opinion, for use on art and works of opinion. And some of them are so restrictive, I believe they should never be used for anything. 
unfortunately, people tend to lump them all together. They think that they think that that if you tell somebody it's a creative right, Creative Commons license, that you've told them something substantial about what the license says, and that's not true. Are there uh, tech web technologies that are emerging that concern you? Well, yes, there are websites. Well, just consider, for instance, Google Earth. You know, it's a proprietary client that talks to a uh, to a server using a secret communications protocol. That's not good. So in that case, this this is maybe a, interesting to explore a little. In that case, now Google could could open up ways to communicate with Google Earth, but that doesn't necessarily make. But they won't. We already asked them. So this is where this would be confusing for people because Google Earth is obviously gratis. Right. It's gratis, but not freedom respecting. The reason that that protocol is secret is specifically to restrict what you can do. The reason that that client program is not free software is specifically to restrict what you can do. Why do you think that they are doing that? Well, I don't just think. They told me that uh, they had to, they had to agree to this to get access to the data. So what we see is a typical intercorporate conspiracy, and just like just as the corporation is a system to uh, diffuse responsibility. Multi, uh, multi-corporate agreements function the same way. They're all participating, but most of them, and maybe all of them, can point at somebody else and say, I'm not responsible. And if you see where those fingers are pointing, they point to somebody that you never deal with. So they've shuffled the responsibility off into a place, off to someone that you have no way to hold responsible. So certainly you approach these situations with, with uh, a great desire to communicate the importance of freedom and and obviously w- with the intent to do as much as you personally can do to encourage freedom. Yes. I've tried to be you uh you've been you've asked me to be very careful in in terms of how I talk about free software. Well, I just don't. I didn't want it to spread the mistaken, widespread mistakes of thinking that I support open source, and th- thinking of the GNU system as part of Linux. The, the the reason I bring these up is because most of the people who write and speak about our community make those mistakes, and most people who've heard anything about our community have taken those mistakes for the truth. So I have to make an effort to ensure that they get corrected, and and so I do. Well, and I appreciate that because you've you've helped me to be more careful, uh, not just about thinking about it, but also in terms of how I ask the questions. Is there anything that we did not discuss today with regard to free software and education that you would want to communicate? <clears throat> It's not enough for the operating system used in the school to be free. Of course, it should be. But schools use other software as well, and for the same reasons, that should be free software. And educational software in particular also should be free software. So I call on all schools to put their efforts into directing the production of educational software into freedom. Schools should choose free educational software. They should look for opportunities to sponsor its development, and they should cut down on their use of non-free educational software, aiming for the day when there will be free software to do everything that they want. We can make this happen. We've seen so much success in the free software field that we know now 
that it just takes building up sufficient momentum to make it happen. So the question is, do you join in building that momentum or do you leave it to others and make it take longer before we get there to freedom? Richard, are there any examples that you feel are worth looking at or promoting of commercial entities who are supporting free software in education? Um, I don't know specifically about education. It's you know, I it, I don't specialize in the field of educational software. I've I'm not a I've only occasionally been a teacher on the side. So uh I'm the wrong person to ask about that. If you look in the free software directory, which is directory.fsf.org, you might find some educational programs. You might find some companies that connected to them. Are there examples of companies or organizations who are uh, operating in the free software arena and are generating revenue and able to pay employees? Oh, yes, there are lots of them. Uh, in France, a few months ago, I was told that the free software companies employ, I think it was 14,000 people. <clears throat> there are many large companies that you've heard of that, uh, that do develop and release free software, although that's not all they do. So I think what you're, you're alluding to is that there are companies who... Uh, will devote resources or personnel to contributing to free software, but do. Well, not just will, but do. Not just will, but do. There are also a lot of smaller companies whose business is based around a free program. And in that case, they're providing service or support? Or they, they sell service and support, or they may sell permission to link that code into a proprietary program. So in that case, their code is all available as free software, but it's available under a license like the GNU General Public License, which is copyleft, and says that anything you include this in must also be free. So if somebody wants to include their code in something that isn't free, they have to negotiate special permission to do so. Now, I wouldn't do this myself because given the leverage that copyleft provides, I would prefer to use it all in order to, to promote free software over and against proprietary software. On the other hand, I've suggested that model to companies as a way of convincing them to make their software available as free software. Well, Richard, I promised you that we would be uh, less than an hour, and you've been generous with your time, and I really want to thank you for, for talking about free software with me. Can I stop by mentioning a few websites? Absolutely. The website of the GNU operating system is gnu.org. The Free Software Foundation's website is fsf.org. And you can also look at our campaign against digital restrictions management, which is defectivebydesign.org. So thank you. No, thank you very much. I appreciate the time and I appreciate your willingness to uh, talk to me today.